beautiful mountains, beautiful people, and now a beautiful beach. This trip just keeps getting better. <laughs> so much for the plethora of jungle footage as the standard image of Africa that proliferates our media screens in America. This was an Africa that was beautiful. You don't really see a lot of this on television about Africa, about the luxury of having huts and beaches and beautiful water and, I mean, umbrellas, everything that you need to enjoy the beach, food, drinks, everything right here. And it's absolutely gorgeous. At the same time, I'm looking at the water and thinking, is this where my people left? Is this where, I, well, or is this where my people swam? Is this where my people fished? You know, had fun, loved each other, had family, walked together on the beach with their first loved one, or their first significant other. So to me, it's hard to look at things like this and just get caught up in the whole commercialism of it, where it's not even commercial, really, but just getting caught into the beauty of it without going a little deeper and thinking to myself, I may be walking in the same areas that some of my ancestors walked, and it's, it's just ab absolutely mind-boggling. It's amazing. It's amazing to hear the water and to hear the sounds. The same sounds that took our people away are the same sounds that's giving me beauty and enjoyment. So it's very, very confusing at times. But we'll see. As I watch the ebb and flow of liquid history, my mind wanders to how the past connects to me in the present. Is this where my people, my African family stood? My thoughts were softly interrupted by Lama Ba, an engineer and assistant who works with Ishmael. He was fascinated by my camera, so I decided to record him and find out a little bit more about who he was and where he's from. My name is Lama Ba. I'm a Sierra Leonean. I'm working for HFC Mortgage and Savings, me and my boss, Mr. Sheriff. So I came here with, uh, what is the name? Janice. Janice and Dia. Kadia and Mr. Sheriff, Ishmael Mori Sheriff. So we are here at the number two peninsula, the west urban area of Sierra Leone. So I like, I like your company, I like this get together. I'm so happy to be with you. I'm proud. So I want to be, because my favorite book in the world is American. So I would like one day. What's your favorite, your favorite what? My favorite passport. Passport is American? Passport book is American. Uh -huh. So I would like one day, um, uh, what the name? Uh, to visit me? Yeah, I would like one day to visit uh, Janice. Janice in which Illinois. State? Illinois. <laughs> Illinois. So I would like that one day. That would be my dream in future to be in America, but I'm a Sierra Leonean as well. We are here, peace, unity, and love, freedom, justice, and peace. So thank you to be with you. So I hope next time we'll be party two. So thank you for that. Welcome. That was really sweet and unexpected. He's proud of me. I can't help but to feel that He's just as excited to see one of his own return as I am. It also feels good to hear someone mention that America is one of their favorite places in the world. As we were leaving the beach, I noticed a group of people having fun underneath a hut. I never meet a stranger, so I stop by to say hello. Well, guess what? We are in Chicago together. Not only were they from Chicago, right up the interstate from where I lived in the States, they were also Mindy, like me. Full of opinion, drama, and not afraid to say anything. Do you know what they call that? Flava bundle. Flava. Flava bundle. We are people who like to argue. <laughs> so instead of being an angry black woman and called a derogatory word, an opinionated, strong African-American woman, who is Mende, would be labeled Bundles. I like this description better than the usual stereotypical response. This is Alfred Sam Foray. He was the first minority graduate in agricultural engineering from where? Yes, the University of Illinois, the same school where I'm working right now at this very moment. This is his lovely wife, Mary Sam Foray. Do you want to hear another coincidence? At home, each time I head into Chicago, 
I see two faces on a billboard advertising a law business, a family law business. Now, all the way in Sierra Leone, I see the same exact two faces right here in person. Yes, Massa Sam Foray and Lisa McLeod are family lawyers practicing in Chicago. Can you believe it? <laughs> so the same two people on the billboard in Chicago are the same two people now that I'm running into on the beach in West Africa, Sierra Leone, beach number two in the middle of the day. How odd and how much does fate play a role? I ask you, it has to be fate. And we're both Mende. I'm huh? going to add that. We're both Mende. Yeah, Mende. Yeah. My sister. Yes. Yeah. So. We share yeah. blood. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It was great meeting everyone. Cece Kanu and Kenya Sam Foray and Pastor Brian Makanu and the whole family. And they were just as friendly as everyone else I've met. They even wanted to say hello to all of you. My family across the waters. I'm so thankful for how things are coming together. What a great day. been up for a while since about 5 30 6 o'clock um, partly because the generator sound was loud all night and the smell of gasoline um, the fumes was very different to get used to but I was so thankful to have electricity um, when you're getting up in the middle of the night to use a restroom and that sort of thing. But also Khadija got us these little flashlights and that was very helpful. So, uh, I'm going to go for now. It is now the day after Christmas. And, um... I look forward to talking to you again. Thank you. So maybe the fumes did get to me just a little. <laughs> Anyways, it appears that I recovered pretty well. And although some situations weren't the best, I was grateful for everything. I was also grateful for the special treatment you get here. Treatment that in the States are usually reserved for rich people. For instance, Ishmael has an assistant named Tutu. Tutu and his family live just outside of the compound. He's hired to clean Ishmael's home, maintain and protect the grounds, and basically do whatever is needed. He runs errands for us, even sees to it that our clothes are washed by hand down at the local river. He usually presses our clothes, folds them, and lays them out every day. This type of employment allows Tutu to take care of his family, immediate and extended. In some ways, it's a very genderized culture here, though, too, where men take care of the men and women take care of the women. However, when it comes to sewing, well, that's another thing. For example, Kadia wanted to have a special outfit made for her upcoming family dedication ceremony. The very next morning, a man and a friend of the family named Nene came by to take care of her request. Nene was in charge of picking out the colors that would best fit and look on Kadia, and the man was in charge of getting the measurements in the actual sewing. Just like that, she would have an outfit delivered later that day, tailor-made. I felt like we were millionaires. I would love to have this privilege at home. During our trips through town, there were many instances where I noticed men in shop sewing. That's because for many years, men were allowed to work outside of the home more than women. That meant that the men took up whatever trade they could, including sewing. Tailoring was a good option because they didn't need electricity. The stitching and sewing fell to the rhythm of the foot, and these men are known to be some of the best tailors around. While Kadia was finishing up her order, this little sweetheart, Nene's daughter, Wadia, decided to give me a live performance and model for the camera. It was obvious that she came to be a star. Can you say, express yourself? <laughs> oh my goodness, where did she learn that move? <laughs> Later that day, Samuel finally showed up again to go over some shooting lessons. 
and I hadn't really seen him since I landed at the airport. He's joined me today. He's going to be helping me shoot this project, and I'm so glad to see him. He lives about 10 miles away that sometimes can be about three hours to get here because of traffic. Mm -hmm. um, as uh, you've seen before in the video and as I've talked about it before in the video. But basically this is another breakfast. Every breakfast, every morning has been different. Um, one morning we had a combination would be spam and potted meat, but it was on the higher end from Holland. We had that with bread, bread and rice, yams and cocoa are huge here, staples. Um, staples in some areas more than others, but still a part of meals, every meal. So have I been watching my carbs? Absolutely. <laughs> have I uh, been able to eat without carbs? Absolutely not, <laughs> for the most part. Except for last night, we stopped by a real restaurant. Uh, my hosts have been so great to me that, um, and we've been through so much with lost luggage and that sort of thing. I felt that I just owed him a great night out. Um, and we finally um, got uh, Kadia's luggage. Ishmael has been driving us everywhere and been taking care of us. And I wanted to treat them to dinner. So we stopped by this one restaurant and I had, of course, seafood. I love seafood. And I had these huge prawns. They're absolutely wonderful. Most things are grilled, stewed, boiled. Very little, very few is for actually fried. Oh, that's a telephone. Now, speaking of the phone, every single time someone calls me or I call them, they use up a lot of units, so hold on. Samuel made himself at home and continued to practice taking shots with my camera of me and the complex and the beautiful foliage. He's from the Moyamba district in Mende, just like me. Well, our family migrated from Moyamba to Watlu. So there they give back to us. So what's the language in Waterloo? Um Creo Timi I mean Limba. I mean with him being from the area, I thought he might be able to tell me why it was so challenging for me to take pictures of people around town. The reason is that people are afraid because people have been coming before this day taking their pictures, make money out of them. So now they are aware that, no, this time we don't take pictures because you don't make money out of our head. They refuse. Sometimes if you point a camera at someone, he will nearly want to slap you or abuse you. But if you talk to that individual and he or she understand, then she will allow you to take the picture. It has been happening all along, so people are afraid now to take pictures without their consent. When they allow you to take their pictures without knowing what you want to do with it. So that's the reason. Up until this time, um, uh, so here I am again, uh, Kadia and um, Ishmael just got home from a wonderful trip to get ready for the reunion of their family, their mother and their father. Um, it, was, uh, it was something that they do, it's a, it's a ritual, it's a tradition that they 
pay respect uh, to their loved ones who have passed on. And on the way back, of course, they came bearing food, which her aunt had uh, made for them. And now I am going to have some of it as well. And uh, you could tell from the other ones, you know I'm a seafood lover, but this is absolutely wonderful looking, right, with the fish, the plantains, and fish and chips. This is fish and chips. Talk about roe fish. Head on everything, and it looks absolutely delicious. I'm going to enjoy that. Of course, rice with everything. Rice is a staple. They have rice um, in cray cray, which is like um, mushed up greens with seafood, blue crabs, crabs, just like in Virginia, um, because of the Atlantic Ocean, we share a lot of the same seafoods and it's absolutely, I know, going to be wonderful. Mm. There's another type of meat in there as well but of course it's spicy with pepper as usual and it's really really good so I'm gonna take out some time to eat and enjoy myself and I'll talk to you next chapter I guess it's emotional because um, sometimes being an African American, you're torn sometimes because when you have these feelings about, you know, globally they like your music, your dance, your style, things like that, but they don't like you and you're still racially profiled and things like that. And then, um, <clears throat> but you love America and you love being American and then, but then you talk about Africa and there's a, a longing, a belonging, a sense of belonging, a sense of you can exhale. Even though you may be surrounded by poverty, you, you feel that. I feel very American, but uh, very African American in a lot of ways, but Sometimes you don't want to give people the wrong idea because you are, um, you don't want to sound like you're betraying America or your Americanism by longing for something else. And I wonder, and that's so different for black Americans because I'm sure none of the other aggregates have this issue. They embrace their Italian American, they embrace their European American, they embrace their Chinese American culture and heritage. And for us, it's, it's new. I mean, we don't know anything about Africa other than roots and whatever else you can research. But um, so I'm torn sometimes of what to say, what not to say, um, because I don't want to give off the wrong idea that I'm not proud to be an American. I think that I'm moving to the point where I'm extremely proud of being an African American. I'm realizing how far we've come by being here. I've realized that for whatever reason, um, our people survived and made it to America and lived. Someone lived because I'm here. So everyone didn't die during slavery. Someone lived. The strong live, the ones who were given mercy live, the ones who were meant to live live, the ones who died died for reasons or no reason, things along those lines. But um, to see where on my mother's side where we came from and where I am um, lets me know of the struggles that are still going on and the struggles that went on to get me to where I am. So I do feel a sense of obligation and responsibility on a global sense to take what I've learned in America and apply it to the world, Sierra Leone, to apply it to Africa. Other people do it all the time. They join the Peace Corps, they, um, they're missionaries. They do it all the time. 
And um, so I guess I'm no different, but it's, di it's a different way of thinking for African Americans. Why is it so emotional for you? Such an emotional experience. You have this big emotional reaction from time to a, that just washes over you. I think I think it's because these are words that I've never said before. And I live by words. I'm a journalist, I'm a teacher. And I've never said these words before. So therefore, I have never tapped into the emotion that's connected to these words before. So it's, it's, like, it's like all of a sudden being rich. You cry because you're happy, but you're rich, but you still cry because it's something new, something different. And I think it's different. I guess, you know, when you have certain feelings, valid, a form of validation comes with that. And I, the validation has to come from within me because I don't see anything else validating what I feel. I don't see anything else validating what I'm doing and what I'm trying to do um, and telling the stories to, for people, all people to see, to feel what it really is to be African-American the things that we've held in, the times that we have marched peacefully um, and holding so much inside, you know, where, where do we put it? You know, where do we put it? Do we put it in a book that only the people who already know are gonna read? Who else is going to read it? I mean, I don't, I don't really know. But I'm not really sure why I'm so emotional sometimes. I think I'm in the process. Um, it's still kind of surreal, but I think I'm getting to a week now that I've been here, and I feel that I'm starting to, to relax a little bit more, and so I'm able to feel more, not just the logistics and, 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 and going here and there and, and that sort of thing and the hustle and bustle, but also just dealing with my own emotions about it, you know, that you can't predict, you know. Is there anything you, when you thought about coming, Oh, gosh. Um, well, I did a lot of research on the Internet and books and read books and that sort of thing. But no, <laughs> it, it did not prepare me for this in a number of different ways. It didn't prepare me for, number one, the beautiful, absolutely beautiful beaches with white sands and the water. It did not prepare me for all of the food that's so much like the food that I grew up on with the greens, there's made differently, the um, spices the that my mother used to cook so much and the seafood and all of that. And so it's the same thing that we've eaten just in a different way for the, for the most part so far. Um, I did not expect that many people in the street. I did not expect, um, I thought to myself, you want to look at entrepreneurship, everyone here has to be an entrepreneur because there, there are no businesses and corporations, so they have to come up with ways to make money. So here, here you have poor people selling to poor people, and poor people actually buy from poor people. And so, and so they're sustaining each other. So poor people are sustaining poor people. I found that fascinating. I found that fascinating. Um, and... Um, I can't remember, um, maybe at Ohio University where the doctorate students, um, uh, my colleagues um, from Africa embraced me. Africans would embrace me in school um, during my PhD and my master's. Um, but to, on a personal level, I haven't had that. And so that was very different. And I feel, I feel blessed. It humbles you. It, it really does humble you in the fact that people are so good you know, in your in their hearts and in their spirits in that they they it seems like it feels like when I talk to the other Sierra Leoneans that they they want to comfort me and they want to welcome me.
it's like they feel my pain and they want me to make it better and I think other people want to make it better as well I think there are good people all over the world in America um, but it's something to see people from so you almost feel like thousands of years ago your mother from Sierra Leone who started it all is hugging you when they hug me through her spirit they hug me and so it makes me feel good it makes me feel good it makes me feel um, comfortable it makes me feel like I'm home and that it's okay and that we're here now <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I thought about. I hate I missed that, but you know, I really wanted you and Ishmael to have a moment, a family moment, and to just not worry about me because everything you all do and have been doing is you know not that you complain about it, but you're always making sure that I get this shot. Did I do this or whatever? And you know, like I said, you know, this is your visit, you know, to your family. You haven't been here for a while, so I really wanted to remove myself from the situation for a moment. And there were things I could do here, and it turned out just fine. Um, but I look forward to to, to uh, continue to meeting uh, uh, other people. So I think this will be a healing, a healing process. And like today, I was fine. I was here by myself. Um, I figured out how to unlock the doors, which are different because you have to turn it ten times to get it to come out, and ten times to get it to come back in. And, yeah, so, um, and, you know, I'm just getting used to everything and, and everything, and uh, and it, it really is beautiful. It just it just completes the picture. It helps complete the picture of African American, and I think that all Americans would want that for us. All, I believe all Americans would want that for African Americans, for them to feel uh, wanted and loved the best way that they can, um, which is also knowing where you're from and that sort of thing, so I think that's really, that's really good, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Hello. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>
It was almost like I was an enemy of some kind. And this made me feel uncomfortable. Then I noticed that everyone was speaking in their native language. Immediately I felt out of place. Immediately I felt totally American. Immediately I felt that I didn't belong. So I quietly walked outside to the car. So, um, this is the first time I kind of felt a little uncomfortable, and I think I'm at this event. It's really great. People are really wonderful, but I don't understand the jokes. I don't understand the language. I don't understand the culture um, that are connected to the jokes and things along those lines. So I'm just kind of learning and listening. It's almost like being at a party where you're a guest and you don't know anyone. It's kind of like that. So I just wanted to capture that um, on record. I not only felt bad about not fitting into the party when I love to socialize, I felt bad about being African American and feeling totally uncomfortable. So I was uncomfortable about feeling uncomfortable. But I made my way back into the party and tried to make the best of it. And I'm glad I did. Because the host and her family and friends saw to it that I got up, moved around, ate good food, and enjoyed the music and I started feeling a little better, actually a lot better. And this little guy became a wonderful escort for the rest of the night. It's their son, Raymond. He wanted to sit next to me for the rest of the evening and take lots of pictures of us. <laughs> I thought that was cute and sweet. And he and everyone really did make me feel a lot more comfortable. You know, I hadn't expected that earlier reaction, but I think it was a good lesson that kept me on my toes. Okay. Good morning. Um, I thought I'd do another um, video entry, um, journal video entry, just to talk to you about the end of my stay here at Ishmael's, which has been absolutely wonderful. Um, I'm heading over to another location now um, on the other side of the city. And um, because of traffic, I'll do most of my work and um, interviews and things like that over there. So. Um, I'm looking forward to that and seeing my friend Mary Bangura, who's now here now in town, and uh, she's flown in, so uh, we're all going to be together how we started. Um, just wanted to tell you about a couple of things. Um, at first, you know, it seemed that I was homesick. You know, returning to my mother's my mother's land, uh, homeland of my ancestors on my mother's side. Um, I became homesick for America, and that was really interesting, um, and, 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 and very, uh, uh, very, um, very nice uh, and warm uh, to receive that emotion uh, that I haven't had in a while. It could be because I haven't uh, gone abroad a lot, except for when I was very young, or it could be because I'm really understanding what it is to be American and from America by visiting another country. Uh, each country has uh, pros and cons, positives and negatives, as any country uh, would have and possess. Um, but it depends on your perspective, I think. Um, uh, for instance, um, I want to tell African Americans right now, in the hot, well, it's not sun in here in my room, but it is muggy and humid, and it's just the morning. Um, so you wake up sweating. Um, but it's really great for your skin. It feels really good. Depends on your perspective, right? Uh, let me tell you about a different perspective that you may not have heard. In talking to the Africans here, um, they were bewildered about the whole slavery aspect. Um, they don't know much about it. Um, they haven't read much about it. The only time you get something like that, that type of education, is if you actually look and search. Um, because they were um, also um, connected to uh, the British and that sort of thing. So, you know, the government um, wanted to, you know, talk about the history that w was important to them that they felt they needed to know uh, to live a prosperous life. Um, that did not include necessarily uh, the issue of the slavery trade. Um, but besides that, what I have received from a lot of the Africans here is that they see African Americans as heroes. They see Afri African Americans as survivors when they find out or they know of the slave trade and, and, and the, all that we've accomplished. Not just Obama, not just Harriet Tubman, not just Martin Luther King, but just being American. They look to African Americans to kind of gauge their own uh, growth. You know, so they're looking at you as far as your image so they can emulate it. Now, with that being said, 
I think that it's important to look at what image are you conveying to the world? What image are you conveying to your African brothers and sisters? Are you conveying certain images by what you wear, by what you say, by how you act? Things along those lines. And to know that they see us as heroes because we survived slavery, we are the survivors of slavery, and that we've gone on to do great things, even just going to school. That's a luxury, to go to school. So I think that, uh, think about you know what you're doing with your college education, for instance. Not saying you're not doing the right things, but just think about it, because the world is watching. You know, you're important to the world and its narratives and its dialogues of how they see African Americans, because African Americans are one of those groups that they think and they see and they perceive as they've made it. They did not even realize that they were poor blacks in America. Can you believe that? So, uh, because America also has its own, you know, idea of a, a dream come true, right? Very interesting. So think about that. Think about that. Um, one of the things I can say was a little disappointing on both ends, African-American, African and American. Um, uh, because it really is, I, I really feel, um, I feel both black American, African American. I feel solely individually American. I do not feel solely individually African. Um, uh, because there is a difference between African American and African. The way we think, the way we do certain things, uh, um, you know, uh, it has uh, been really eye opening, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later. But one of the things that was really disappointing, I think, a little bit is when I heard um, only one song that I've heard um, with the influx of songs coming in, especially from other 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 countries. Um, um, African provinces and things along those lines. People are making it. You could hear, you know, um, um, Sierra Leonean music, Mende music, Nigerian music is huge. But one of the uh, things that I found disappointing is the word, using the N word in the songs. I've only heard it once. And that's what they've learned from us. That's what they've learned that the N word is okay, even in Africa. They don't even use the N-word. It's not even in their language or their vocabulary. In their vernacular, they have no idea what N is for. When I say they're like, what is that? But they've learned it from our music. Hmm. So again, I think we need to take responsibility and accountability uh, for the messages that we give the world. And then we can criticize uh, once we take care of our own messages. I think that's a good lesson. Think about it. Think about it. It has been wonderful here. The beaches are beautiful. Um, I'm starting to get accustomed to everything. Uh, I miss my friends. Um, I miss, I said, I'm going to have to really start dating when I get back. <laughs> I really want to, I mean, because you see so much family and uh, love and romance and all these wonderful things that... Um, I thought to myself, you know, uh, I really need to make some changes in my life when I get back. Um, but it has been, uh, thus far, it's just been eye opening and it's been wonderful. So I hope that you'll be able to get a chance to experience this. Until then, you can experience it through my eyes. And um, on to the next chapter. Of me? Yes. Why are you proud of me? <laughs>
you are beautiful. Uh, because it's so good. I'm good. Yes, yes. you are beautiful. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. You, you too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you too. Thank you. I love you. I love you. <laughs> I love you too.